Good morning, church. The reading today is from Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Hear the word of God. Thank you, church. My name is Eseko, as I mentioned, one of the elders and pastors here at Fellowship City. Um, And this morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. We are in, our, in the second episode of our series, Basic Discipleship. Reino kicked us off last week. Uh, this is our second episode, and this is because we are a disciple-making church. We remind people every Sunday by expressing our key distinctives that we're gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. Shiami unpacked that a little bit earlier during the announcements. So reflecting on what it means to be a disciple, as elders, we asked ourselves what a disciple looks like. We believe that a disciple is someone who loves God and loves people. You'll see an image of a triangle that best explains how that unpacks itself. So we believe that a disciple is someone who loves God and loves people. So how do you know if someone loves God and loves people? We believe this is centered around three things. The first is knowing God through reading the Bible and being in spaces where you experience and encounter more of God. The second is committing faithfully to transformation, to fellowship, to meeting and doing life with God's people and committing to the mission of Fellowship City, which is to see God's kingdom come by transforming lives in and through his transcultural church and also the mission of the wider church, of the greater church, church with capital C, which is to make disciples from the Great Commission. The third is giving generously of time, talents, and treasure. If you don't give of your time, if you don't give of your talents, if you don't commit to the fellowship and life building of God's people, if you don't commit to being in spaces to encounter God, then do you love God and do you love his people? For the next few weeks, we look at the three different legs of how do you know if you love God and love people. We circle around these. This morning, we look at what it means to be faithfully committed to transformation in loving God and loving people. That is our title this morning, committing faithfully to transformation. To unpack this theme, we need to start with the word Transformation. What is transformation? The Cambridge Dictionary describes transformation as a complete change in the appearance or character of something or someone, especially so that that thing or person is improved. Synonyms of the word transformation are convert or metamorphosis, which is the same as the word for metamorphosis. In biology, transformation is the genetic alteration of a cell by introduction of extraneous DNA. An example is the butterfly, which transforms from an egg to a caterpillar, a cocoon, and then a butterfly. This is biology, and the butterfly has to get through the stages of transformation as it grows. And at the end of each stage of transformation, it cannot go back to the previous stage. The butterfly lives in the new reality of its new stage as transformation continues. So we will unpack further transformation in the context of our passage this morning. And as we do so, we'll see that our eyes are open to the experience and encounter of God being central to that. Once we truly accept Jesus, then we leave the life of old and we cling to the new. We cling to the new stage. We cling to be transformed into people who love God and love people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can gather together to sing songs of praise and worship, to fellowship, and to hear from your word. I pray that at this time that you quiet our minds and our hearts, 
Help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear your word. As the Holy Spirit speaks to us, tugs at our heart, would be receptive and willing to hear. I pray that by your spirit that you'd help us to understand your word and to be transformed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a picture of Thomas Goodwin, a Puritan theologian and preacher from the 1600s. Puritan referring to a belief uh, that to be redeemed from the individual's sinful condition that a covenant relationship with God was paramount. It was absolutely necessary. Puritan meaning a belief that God reveals himself through preaching and the Holy Spirit is active in salvation for the individual. A a Puritan believing that strict moral discipline and purity is the correct response to salvation or the Christian life. These are some of the beliefs that Thomas Goodwin grew up with. Because Thomas Goodwin grew up in a Christian home. He was quite religious, uh, being born to parents who believed and taught him those beliefs. Thomas Goodwin decided or knew early in life that he wanted to be a preacher. In his early ministry days, he had a ministry that was focused on creating guilt through teaching to get people to improve. This is because he was not a Christ-centered preacher who had experienced and encountered God through God's grace in his life. But then he heard a sermon that caused him years of reflection. He then heard counsel from another pastor seven years on who told him not to trust anything in himself whether performance, whether feelings, but to look out and rest on Christ alone. That's what this pastor tells him seven years on as he grapples with the sermon that he heard. This is what freed Thomas Goodwin. This is what transformed him. In his transformation, he could not go back when he encountered the grace of God, when he heard these words that he should not trust anything in him, himself, whether performance or feelings, but to look out and rest on Christ alone. His mind was changed, his ministry was changed, and this came from understanding the depth of sin, that people can't just change. We are incapable of doing good, we are incapable of loving God and loving people in and of ourselves. Goodwin began to have a view of God's grace in Jesus that rescues those who are dead in their trespasses and sin. Only an encounter with the grace of God can change people, can transform the individual. This changed his preaching to Christ-centered preaching rather than work on guilt-based improvement. We will experience the mercy of God, knowing God, encountering God, as we look at transformation this morning, similar to what would have helped Thomas Goodwin grapple with what transformation actually looks like. Four points this morning, the mercies of God, the encouragement, the transformation, and the renewal of the mind. Let's look at our first one. We've only got two lines of text, so we will be out of here quickly this morning. The mercies of God, that is our first point. Our passage this morning starts with the words, therefore. It is an important word because it shows a link to what has come before and what is to come. It means as a result of or consequently then the following apply. So then it's important to understand what comes before this word, therefore, and is then the basis of what comes after the word, therefore. This is an image from the Bible Project, which has an overview of Romans. Paul writes Romans to the church in Rome, which is somewhat a divided church with both Jews and Gentiles. The division is brought by disagreements on how to follow Jesus, on different perspectives on whether customs should be followed, like circumcision, like Sabbath, like following traditional Jewish customs. So Paul writes Romans to bring about unity by explaining the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. 
Romans as a book can be broken up into four sections which hinge all on the gospel. The first four chapters can be titled as the gospel reveals God's righteousness. The gospel reveals God's righteousness. Chapters 5 to 8 can be titled as the gospel creates a new humanity. The gospel creates a new humanity. Then chapters 9 to 11 can be titled as the gospel fulfills God's promise to Israel. The gospel fulfills God's promise to Israel. And chapters 12 to 16 can be titled as the gospel unifies the church. So we're looking at the beginning of that unification in the flow of the story of Romans. It's important to also understand some ideas from chapters 1 to 4 to understand chapter 12. The first is that all humanity is trapped in sin. The world has a sin problem that stems from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, defying God and wanting to be king and ruler of their own lives. So removing God from his rightful place as king over their lives, believing that they know better than God. This sin problem continues from Genesis 3, and we see it through the Bible as things evolve and the world disintegrates into chaos, idol worship, and abandoning of God. The Torah, through God's chosen people, Israel, shows that people can't follow the law of God. We are incapable of following the law of God in and of ourselves. But then Jesus, the Son of God, takes on our guilt and serves our punishment from a God who punishes sin. Jesus is bruised, is beaten, is spat on, carries our cross, is mocked, and dies a shameful death in our place because of our sin. I want you to consider this as a moment of clarity, even for Thomas Goodwin, a moment of transformation in encountering God as a forgiver of sins, as king. Thomas Goodwin then understood that he could not be good without God. He can't trust anything on, of himself. That is what the words of the other pastor to him said. He understood that he could not even try to be good without God. This is true for us. We are not good. We cannot love, or love God or love people without God. We can try like Thomas Goodwin attempted in how he taught, but then we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we fail time and time again without seeing and accepting and, and realizing the grace of God. I want you to consider for yourself if you know Jesus, the same Jesus who died for us. If you have read the gospel accounts, you will, you'll know about Gethsemane, a place that means oil press. Jesus goes there to pray after Passover. This is the night before he is crucified. This time Jesus is sorrowful even though he had been to Gethsemane before, he had prayed there before, but this time he's sorrowful to the point of death. Jesus prays that this cup would pass him over. He prays to God that he would not face separation from him and that he would not have God forsake him. He prays that he would not be crucified, beaten, mocked, and shamefully die. This is what we deserve. But Jesus says that God's will prevail. If Jesus, who is God, is sorrowful to face the separation, can you imagine how we would face the separation which we deserve? Jesus is nailed to the cross with thick nails. These nails had to be knocked into his hands and feet. These nails had to hold him up on the cross. So you can imagine they have to go deep into the wood, deep through his hands. Jesus hangs on the cross and dies. As he hangs there, he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is our place in which Jesus stands. Jesus draws his last breath, and on the third day, he raises to life because he said he would. In the Bible, he says that the temple will be raised on the third day. Jesus raising from the dead shows that he conquers death. It is Jesus defeating and breaking the power of sin and the power of death. Jesus defeats death because he lived a perfect life, life without sin, and because he is the Son of God. 
This is the depth of love that God has for us, that he would send his son to die for us. Those who raise their fists at God as those who believe they know more than God. So then through the death of Jesus, we have a new identity. If we have placed our faith and trust in him, we have a new identity. We are sons and daughters of the Lord God. We are a new humanity. Our sins are forgiven. We are justified and we are right. We are justified meaning we are righteous because Jesus is righteous. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus. This is a great news, church family. That if we have put our faith and trust in God, that we are justified and we are made right with God. And we are part of this new humanity. Paul reminds the Romans that to follow Jesus is to leave behind their old humanity and to live a life like Jesus lives. So as we zoom in or focus on chapter 12, we have to remember the big picture. Again, because of faith in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are together people of God if they follow Jesus through God's Spirit. They are people of God if they follow Jesus through God's Spirit. Therefore, because of faith in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles are together people of God, part of a new humanity because of Jesus who leads the new humanity through his death on the cross and a new humanity through the Holy Spirit of God. And we form part of this new humanity if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus. Let's look at verse 1. It says, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God. We've just understood what has come before, and now we're looking at what Paul wants to say through chapter 12, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, the mercies we just spoke about, God creating a new humanity through Jesus who takes our place and punishment. So through the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Let's look at our second point, the encouragement. Paul speaks out of a reality of love and mercy of God. So because of the mercies of, Paul, of God, Paul encourages us. The word used here which in the, is, is, is urge, which in the Greek is the word parakaleo, which, which means to encourage, to exhort. So then Paul speaks about a sacrifice, which is our bodies, which must be holy and pleasing to God. With the use of our bodies here, Paul is encouraging us through the use of our hands, our feet, our mouths, our ears, our whole body should be presented as a sacrifice to God. That is what Paul is urging us here to do. I think the body here is simple because in the world we live in, that is what is most present. Wherever we walk, sleep, work, this is how people engage with us, this is how people see us, this is how we engage with the world, through our body. This is how we help people, this is how we do life, through our body. If you think about the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they died to atone for sins. Bodies here as a living sacrifice means that we should use our bodies as we live to make much of God. So not as, not as a sacrifice as of old, which would be atoning for our sins, but that our sins are already forgiven, and then we ought to use our bodies to make much of God as a living sacrifice, pointing to God. Our bodies should be holy, which is similar to Righteous. They should be set apart for God. Used only for God in making much of God. Pleasing to God in how we use our bodies. This is our true worship. Using our bodies as a living sacrifice to proclaim Christ where he has placed us. So what we should what, should, what we should be reading as we engage the text is to remember Jesus who dies on the cross for us as an atoning sacrifice. Because of this mercy, we should honor God in how we live. 
We should use our bodies where he's placed us. People should see God in how we use our bodies. This is how we worship God in how we live. So everything in verse 1 is completely and totally about God. Because of his mercy, because of what he has done, we should worship him and we should point back to him in how we show our faith and mercy and, and show his mercy in us. Let's look at transformation. So if you're listening to this, you're probably asking yourself, how, Paul? How do I point to God in how I use my body? How do I proclaim Christ through my body in worship? Paul continues in verse 2. Paul uses transformation. He says we must be transformed by the renewing of the mind. The word renewing is interesting because if you, have re- if you have to renew your passport or renew your cell phone contract or renew your gym membership, all these things express that the thing being renewed is not in the right state. That it may be invalid, it may be broken, and it may be expired. If we look at earlier scripture in Romans, Romans 1 verse 21 to 23, for they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. So our minds have become worthless. And worse, they they have exchanged or replaced thoughts of God with thoughts of other men with thoughts of birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Paul seems to hate zoos and has never been on an animal hunt. Um, What we should see is that if we don't have a renewed mind, our mind could be stuck on other things except for God. That means God is not first if we don't have a renewed mind. Verse 2 starts with, don't be conformed to this age. That is what this age is all about. Their minds are not transformed. Their minds are concerned about themselves. It is the common horror movie scene when you walk into a room where there's only mirrors. If I do watch such a scene, my, such a scene, my first thoughts is, where were you going? So when you're in this maze of mirrors, wherever you turn, you only see yourself. This should be scary like in the movies, but in real life, that is what is first in our mind of mirrors if we don't have God first. With a transformed mind, we can discern what is good, what is pleasing, and what is the perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? That's a great question. So what Paul is referring to here is the will of command. So basically, the will of command is as God has commanded in his word. So the word of God provides the will of God in this context. Through understanding and studying the word of God, we know God. And we know his will, the will of command. Through knowing God, we have a transformed mind because God then takes his rightful place in our mind and in how we use our body. In knowing the, God of, the word of God, we're able to discern what is good and what is pleasing. So what are some of the commands of God that we should know? Mark 12, verse 30 to 31 reads as follows. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other command greater than these. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. What we learn from these commands is that we ought to love God and we ought to love people. We learn that we ought to share the gospel. We ought to use our bodies as a living sacrifice. We need to have our bodies make much of God. 
And that is how we're able to care and love for others and bring glory to God. Renewal of the mind. Let's look, at, let's look back at what it means to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. We've already spoken about our minds being corrupted and in need of being renewed so that we don't conform to the ways of the world. If you look at other occurrences of the word renew, you will only find one in the New Testament, which is in Titus 3, verses 4 to 5, and it reads as follows. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness, that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Renewal happens through or by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when we accept Christ as Savior, comes and dwells in us. The Holy Spirit then changes us from the inside out, showing us things that we need to change, showing us and pointing us to the cross of Christ as a reminder for who we are. We belong to God And we are saved by Jesus on the cross. The Holy Spirit helps us to encounter God, to behold God. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the word of God as we read the commands of God. The Holy Spirit helps us understand who God is and how to use our bodies as a living sacrifice. Secondly, the Holy Spirit helps us to apply the commands of God as he transforms us our minds. Through a transformed mind, we apply the gospel in everyday situations like what, like what job to take, how to handle situations at work, perspective in the face of loss, wisdom in marriage, pers- and, and courage in witnessing for God. So the Holy Spirit enables transformation in the mind by enabling the renewing of the mind. One of the commands of God is found in Colossians 3, verse 8 to 10. But now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. I know that as I read this, anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language, these sound hard. But then with a renewed mind, with the help of the Holy Spirit, this is how we're able to put these off and put on the new self. So what we should know this morning is that the mercy of God is seen in Jesus who dies on the cross for us as an atoning sacrifice. Because of this mercy, we should honor God in how we use our bodies, where he has placed us. People should see God in how we use our bodies, how we do life. We can only use our bodies as a living sacrifice if we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, which happens through the Holy Spirit in understanding the will of God found in the Word of God. The will of God helps us to discern what is good and pleasing. It helps us to truly worship God through our bodies and minds. So if you're listening to this, um, what does it all mean for me? Here are some next steps. Here are some things that you ought to know. To be faithfully committed to transformation means knowing God and encountering Him. It means spending time reading the Word of God because through the Holy Spirit we encounter and we meet God and the renewal of the mind happens. If we aren't reading the Bible, then our minds are not being renewed and there will be no transformation then our mind are conformed to the ways of the world as we saw in Romans 12, 1 to 2. There have been multiple studies conducted that show the transformational power that the Holy Spirit has as we read the Bible. One study, by, one study done by Dr. Michael Ferguson shows evidence for dopamine being released in the brain if we read the Bible. This makes you focused, this makes you motivated, and this makes you happy. So the question is, how often are you reading the Bible? Are you focused, motivated, and happy? If not, look at how often you're reading the Bible. Reading the Bible in the same study says, reading the Bible for 30 minutes daily improves concentration. Are you struggling with concentration? If 30 minutes sounds like a long time, 
How much time do you spend watching TV, scrolling social media, or WhatsApp? How much time do you spend at the gym exercising? How much time do you spend studying, reading the news, or book of your choice? These are not bad things, but for our minds to be transformed, to be renewed, we need to, have, we need to put God first. The word discern that we read earlier sometimes means discerning between what is good and what is better, not only what is good or bad. So these things aren't bad things. These things are good things. But for our minds to be renewed, for our minds for us to be transformed, we need to, ha- we need to put God first in our minds. And reading the Bible regularly helps us with that. The same study says reading the Bible encourages positive behavior or attitude. Are you struggling with anger, with jealousy, with rage, with pride, with lust, with addiction? A study from the Center of Bible Engagement shows results that reading the Bible between one and three times a week has a negligible effect. There's no, there's no effect, basically. So this means there's no effect. So just coming to church on a Sunday and reading along with Chanel as she reads the teaching text will, will have no effect. But that same study says there's real change that starts to happen when we're reading four or more times a week. Feeling lonely drops by 30%. Anger drops by 32%. Bitterness in relationship drops by 40%. 57% drop in alcoholism. Being spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Spiritually stagnant meaning feeling like you're stuck or not growing in your relationship with God. So if you read the Bible four times at least, then being spiritually stagnant drops. Viewing pornography drops by 60%. Remember Colossians 3, verse 8 to 10? If you're reading the Bible at the very least four times, then you're able to put to death the things that we should not be doing. We're able to be transformed by the Word of God. One of the commands which are put, um, or part of, of God's will for our lives, is seen in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, which is the Great Commission to make disciples who make disciples. The study from the Center of Bible Engagement says reading the Bible at least four times a week increases your ability to share your faith by 200%. This is because you have confidence as you continue to know who God is, as you encounter Jesus walking on the pages of Scripture. Vaughn Roberts, a well-known book author who writes books like Turning Point and Setting Hearts on Fire, grew up in a Christian home but one day was challenged by his sister about his faith. He was angry to be challenged, but he went to the Bible. Reading the gospel, he says it was like seeing Jesus walking on the pages of scripture as he encountered who Jesus is. This is how we come to knowledge of who God is, by reading the Bible, by reading the gospels, by understanding and knowing who God is. Just like Thomas Godwin, as we spoke about earlier. Here's a quote from John Piper on how to read the Bible. Let the one who reads, read slowly and deeply, and with tears and with longing to live it and speak it as he sees it. It should be like eating a good stew or beef cheeks. Um, Leon Klopper is a specialist of beef cheeks. I encountered that after I ate some of that after eat and run. There will be no pictures just so we can get through the sermon this morning. So when, when you eat beef cheeks or, or stew, you don't rush eating it. You savor the meal. You try to feel the flavors. You suck on the bone if there's bones and you make sure it's clean. Sometimes you go for a second helping because of how good it is. This is how John Piper encourages us to read slowly, asking the text, text questions, thinking about what you're reading, 
thinking about the audience who's receiving this and thinking about the writer who's writing this and forming prayer habits as you read the Bible, asking the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand what you're reading. Reading the Bible also motivates us to be in community as we see Jesus being in community with his disciples. God is a God of community. Another next step, are you committed to being with God's people? Committed to coming regularly to church? Church isn't the choice in the morning between tired, between cleaning, between running or, or studying. Church is where you meet God's people for fellowship, where you sing songs of praise and worship together. As you sing, you're edified and you're built up in your walk. And others are also built up and edified as you meet with others as well. Church is where you hear the word of God and through the Holy Spirit encounter God. You may not call Fellowship City home, but you need to belong to a family of believers. You need to be committed to the fellowship. You need to be coming regularly to church to be edified, to be encouraged, to be built up in your walk as well as the walk of others. Commit to knowing others and being known. Speak to other believers. Build relationships. This is how we use our body to know, to love, and to serve others. If you don't know how your brothers and sisters are doing, but you know the score of the Protea versus Afghanistan game, or you know the Soweto Derby score, then you're not committed to God's people, but maybe committed to the world. Again, these are not bad things. But what is first in our hearts and minds? If you don't commit to God's people, how will you develop and grow in your love of others? How do you know if you love others? A battery that you plug into any device, um, AAA or, or AA or the 9 volt batteries, can be used in different devices or different things. It can be used in a remote, in an appliance, or maybe even in a toy. They can work together, but you will notice most appliances or things that use batteries require more than one. If you have more batteries together, they generate more energy. They bring power to what they're used for. This is similar to what I'm referring to. We aren't made to be alone, we aren't made to walk alone. Together we can do more, and used together we bring power and glory to the name of God. So commit to the fellowship and commit to meeting with God's people. Find a place to serve. There are multiple places to serve during our Sunday services and even out of our, out of our Sunday services. Serving is a way to be in spaces where you are known and being known. It is a space where you can use your body, your hands and feet as a living sacrifice. Next step, are you serving and where? This may be your next step. If you are not sure how you could be serving, come and speak to me after the service. Lastly, as we, as we close, we can't do any of this without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the help of the Holy Spirit as we read the Bible the help of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to love God and to love people, to be in community. So we need to pray. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to come. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to transform us as we read the Bible and as we desire to be in community. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, your mercy is what brings us life. That your mercy rescues us from sin that seeks to entrench us and brings us into a new humanity. That the death of Christ on the cross for our sins brings us life. I pray that we may regularly encounter your mercy, whether it be with meeting with, with other like-minded brothers and sisters, as well as reading our Bible. May we encounter Jesus. May the Holy Spirit move as we read your word, as we meet together as brothers and sisters. 
as we follow in the words of the Great Commission to make disciples who make disciples. The Holy Spirit, strengthen us, build us up, encourage us. The Holy Spirit, transform us by the renewing of our minds. And as the Holy Spirit moves, would, would we not grieve the Holy Spirit? Would we desire to know more of you? And we can only do that if we spend time reading your word and spend time in spaces where we can encounter you, Lord God. This morning as we sing our last song, would the Holy Spirit move among us, focus us on your love. Would the Holy Spirit speak to us and tell us those things that you want us to know, to say, and to do. And would the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name.